Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. Today, we'll discuss the current issues facing energy companies headed towards a restructuring. I'm Mark Fisher, Director of Credit Research for America's Core Credit. And joining me on today's webinar are distressed legal analyst Kevin Eckhart and Sean Daly. Please note that if you'd like to revisit this webinar later, a replay of today's discussion will be available on the Reorg Media page within 24 hours. Today, we will provide an overview of unique issues that face energy companies as they begin the Chapter 11 process, and in particular, how companies can use certain tools to help them navigate recent events, such as the severe drop in commodity prices and reduction in financing alternatives. We will discuss debtors' ability to reject midstream contracts and issues companies might face in dealing with working interest owners and certain stakeholders, including investors and affiliates. Building on recent case law and precedent from the current cycle and from 2014 and 2015 restructurings, we will discuss these issues and many more. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A widget, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. So let's get started. So before handing it off to the experts, I just want to go through a brief history of the energy markets, particularly as it relates to valuation and financing. As you can see on the left-hand side, prior to demand concerns from the coronavirus in uh, 2020, oil was pretty range-bound uh, for the prior period, from about $50 to $70 uh, per barrel. During that time, investors overall seemed less inclined to take risk and demanded more return on capital. Many companies rationed CapEx investment in favor of cash flow and dividends. And then when valuations hit credit markets for energy companies, we saw a number of companies buying back uh, their debt at discounts. Uh, fears, questions um, on valuation, which uh, were likely due to questions on future inventory and the reality of type curves and assumptions on parent-child wells. Um, but the industry, the picture here captures what the industry was trying to say. This is from Sanchez Energy, and this is on the bottom right, Sanchez Energy presentation from a couple of years ago. Uh, what the industry is trying to say is that they were able to uh, drill closer together and in more layers beneath the surface without sacrificing output. Those promises, however, in many cases were proved wrong, which led to declining valuation and optimism on future asset value. So all that, though, deals were getting done. EP Energy was in the process of restructuring, relying on a rights offering to take it out of bankruptcy, and certain companies that emerged with cleaned up balance sheets, such as Jones Energy, were later were later bought. So on this slide, if you, know, if you see on the left side, um, we jump to 2020 for oil, beginning of the year, concerns on demand drove oil down, and then on March 9th, oil dropped 25%, following what the market perceived to be a price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. What followed were a series of CapEx cuts by many producers, followed by cuts by service companies, and then recently we've seen offshore drillers have contracts terminated. In terms of restructuring, things really got flipped. For companies in bankruptcy, we've seen plans cut or, termina or terminated. EP Energy, after the plan was confirmed, the parties agreed to terminate. Sanchez Energy just filed a plan in which the dip would be the fulcrum, and Alta Mesa recut its sale to lower the price by a third. For companies that prior to this had what were previously perceived low hurdles, as in the case of Whiting Petroleum's less than $200 million convert, Filed for Chapter 11 when that convert was due, and others like Hornbeck and California Resources, which targeted extensions of debt through exchanges, scrapped those plans. And in the case of Hornbeck, Reorg has reported and pivoted to developing a Chapter 11 plan. So uh, again, what are we going to do uh, today in this changing environment? We have legal analysts uh, Kevin Eckhart and Sean Daly with us to navigate everyone through these unique challenges that these energy companies face. And, um, Without, uh, without any more, let's uh, send this over to the experts, as I say. Uh, Kevin um, is going to walk you through the next step. Thanks, Mark. Uh, this slide gives an overview of the typically active stakeholders in an oil and gas restructuring situation and bankruptcy case. First, of course, you have the RBL, or the Reserve Based Lending Facility, and their agents. Uh, then, generally, you have a group of term lenders uh, sometimes at multiple levels, 1L or 2L, and in between. Um, after the term lenders come the unsecured bondholders. Uh, you may also get secured note holders, uh, such as an EP Energy, with divisions as fine as 1.125 liens, 1.25 liens, and 1.5 liens, 
all of whom feel like litigating in, against each other. Uh, typically, counsel for these parties, the RBL, uh, term lenders, note holders, or, or ad hoc groups of these parties, will be involved in the pre-bankruptcy negotiations. The rest, from here on, are often not involved in those discussions and find out about the bankruptcy when it's filed. Uh, you have non-operating working interest holders. Uh, sometimes the debtor is an NOWI holder itself. These are parties that agree to share the income and costs of the exploration project subject to an operating agreement or JV agreement. Um, a good example of a fight over issues with these parties is the Sanchez case, which we will discuss later. Uh, then you have lessor royalty interest holders that, that are parties uh, that lease mineral rights to the debtors via leases or other agreements and receive royalties based on production and sales from the wells. Uh, some of these debtors will also have sponsors that are investors that provide equity infusions. And in some cases, as we'll see, the, the sponsors control the management of the debtors. Uh, you have trade creditors, uh, those who provide services uh, and goods and equipment, such as prepont for, uh, for frac. Uh, drilling, um, rig providers, and other oil field services companies. Um, you have general unsecured creditors, although they're generally not individually active in these cases, but participate through an official committee of unsecured creditors. And finally, uh, government agencies often have interests, either as lessors themselves, if there are wells on government lease land, or as environmental regulators. Thanks for setting the stage, Kevin. So before we get into more specifics, I figured we'd spend a minute talking about the allocation of risks and value as parties are negotiating either restructuring support agreements or plan support agreements, backstop commitments, or APAs and, and dips. As Mark mentioned, we've seen already with certain cases that were in bankruptcy and had deals, those deals either fall apart or get substantially recut. So it's just a, a great reminder to go back, look at your deal docs, thinking about an agreement, who has what performance obligations, at what times, by what deadlines, is someone going to be incentivized to not take action until some outside date, or are they motivated by the way uh, risk has been divvied up to take some affirmative action? Just a reminder, look at your reps and warranties, in Alta Mesa, there was some back and forth over uh, supposedly secured financing and the, the timing at which you would measure reps and warranties. Milestones, Sanchez Energy, we just saw the dip lenders had a milestone requiring the debtors to file an acceptable plan. That got pushed out as the cases carried on, and then the lenders finally said, okay, uh, you know, enough is enough, sent a notice of default, and miraculously, of course, by uh, the next business day, there was a, a weekend in between, for the next business day, they had reached an agreement in principle with the debtors on the, the contours of the plan. Events of default, right, uh, could be much, much more broad than just milestones. Closing conditions, and then uh, termination fees. Interestingly, in EP Energy, which you'll hear more about later on, uh, when the debtors came into court with an agreement with their backstop parties to terminate the, the deals they had negotiated previously and actually had been confirmed by the court, uh, it was mentioned, you know, everyone looking at it, you might think very generally, oh, you know, this is, this is due to the uh, change in the state of the world, which is absolutely true, but it was brought up that, oh, it would be in the best interest of the estate to avoid a potential administrative expense from a uh, termination fee that might be due by the debtors to the, the uh, counterparties. Also, it will be interesting going forward to see how or whether future option value is divvied up in plans. Do you use warrants that are struck at sort of increasing uh, prices or potential future valuations? And then in Alta Mesa, with their reconfigured deal, the debtors would actually receive a 5% overriding royalty interest. Um, so just you know, getting a little bit more creative, thinking about the, the ways to uh, potentially divvy up value at a time when there is more uncertainty about the future direction of oil prices. At the top of the typical EMP capital structure is a revolving credit facility backed by value ascribed to the borrowers, oil and gas reserves. 
we'll go through uh, a few different aspects of RBL facilities and, and how they may play into a stressed or distressed borrower's activities. First off, it's important to note that these facilities are generally subject to twice annual borrowing based redeterminations where the amounts available to the borrower may be increased, left the same, or decreased. The semi-annual spring and fall determinations are scheduled. Um, documents may provide for a discretionary redetermination, say one for the lenders and one for the debtors between each semi-annual scheduled redetermination. And there may be other discretionary provisions such as uh, you know, the lenders having the right to call a redetermination upon the, or a, yep, a redetermination upon the termination of a swap. If a borrowing base is reduced to less than the amount already drawn, borrower will have to repay that access. Alta Mesa ran into that situation last year, and lo and behold, they wound up filing for Chapter 11 a day before the first of five monthly payments was due. We also just saw this in Chaparral, uh, more about which in a moment. And then one final thing to note about borrowing base redeterminations is it's sort of a, a natural time for a stressed borrower to potentially seek covenant relief from its lenders. So we're coming up on the front end of the spring 2020 semi-annual redeterminations. According to a survey from Haynes and Boone, industry expected sort of in the, in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 percent cuts. Range Resources, one of the first names, reported no change. And then Chaparral was cut following a draw under the lender's interim redetermination authority. So even though it was coming up to the scheduled semi-annual timing, uh, they went ahead and used their interim ability. So Chaparral is just one example, had a $325 million borrowing base with $160 million drawn on March 31. They drew on April 2nd as a precautionary measure to increase their cash position. And then that evening, lenders exercised the right to make an interim redetermination. So interesting to see whether that trend will continue with other borrowers this season. Obviously, everyone is sort of subject to the overall uh, commodity price environment, which, as Mark mentioned, has, has changed drastically in recent months. Moving to the fun stuff, what can you do with an RBL? We've seen a trend in, this is true of the, uh, the prior downturn in 2015, 2016, as, as well as more recent cases, preemptive draws. And I, we're using preemptive here as just a shorthand for liquidity conservation or preservation driven draws. Uh, another reminder, check the docs, review conditions precedent to any draw. We saw last month, Bona Vista Energy said uh, or disclosed in a, a regulatory filing that its lenders had denied a draw request, even though the company, of course, claimed that the conditions precedent were met. And then a week later, they obtained a month-long temporary waiver of conditions precedent to the draw. Um, without specifying anything further about what the uh, the lenders may have cited to and, and not honor the draw request. Look for anti-hoarding provisions that say you can't have X dollars of, over X dollars of cash on your balance sheet, uh, it, which was a, a measure used to try and prevent this move. And finally, preemptive draws may be used in anticipation of a bankruptcy filing. But in petroleum drew a significant amount, quote, sufficient to ensure that the debtors had more than adequate liquidity to operate through 2020, less than a week before filing for Chapter 11. So why would a borrower do that? Well, a use of cash collateral to fund cases may be faster and cheaper than a dip facility. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're a borrower who may be uh, subject to a, a negative borrowing base redetermination, capital markets may not be your friend when it comes to trying to line up a dip. Also, I, I think interesting to note here, Whiting uh, disclosed in their representations at the outset of the case that they hadn't really considered a Chapter 11 filing in detail until March 20, and then a week and a half later, they were in Chapter 11. So 
draw what you have access to rather than going out to find something new may be a, a strategy seen a little bit more often if uh, markets, capital markets do not remain uh, accommodative. Thanks for handling the fun stuff, Sean. Now I'm going to take a break from drawing on my own personal revolver, a.k.a. my credit cards, to get into uh, some of the miscellaneous considerations that debtors have to face when they are uh, looking to file a bankruptcy case and are getting on the eve of a filing. Uh, as discussed, uh, as you mentioned a second ago, and as we'll discuss a little more thoroughly in a second, the debtors must choose primarily between funding their case via incremental dip financing, a new post-petition loan, or the use of cash collateral, as in whiting. Uh, the debtors and lenders must resolve the anticipated treatment of the RBL facility, which is generally either refinanced or reinstated in the bankruptcy, often depending, as the debtors in Whiting um, make clear, on, quote, market conditions. Of course, in Whiting, they haven't uh, made that choice yet and are going to try to uh, make that determination after the case was filed. If the debtors obtain new dip financing and secure incremental new money from a new lender other than the prepetition lenders, they must determine how to adequately protect prepetition lenders for the priming lien on their collateral that secures those new dip funds for the new dip lender. Um, they'll try to secure the prepetition lender's consent for those priming liens in order to avoid uh, a, a lien battle at the first day hearing. If dip financing is provided by prepetition lenders, the dip will typically roll up prepetition debt converting it to protected dip debt, um, and that may raise concerns with an eventual unsecured creditors committee. Adequate protection is typically provided to prepetition lenders in the form of replacement liens, uh, interest payments, sometimes with a default premium, and super priority claims, as well as payment of professional fees for the advisors um, to the prepetition lenders, which can be significant. Uh, moving to w exactly what could be encumbered with these DIP or, or replacement cash collateral and adequate protection liens, there may be segregated or statutory trust funds in the debtor's name, such as royalty payment funds or funds earmarked for uh, repayment of joint interest billing obligations advanced by other interest holders that may or may not be available as security for a DIP or for use as adequate protection for prepetition lenders. A couple other items that debtors need to think about. Uh, the debtors must also secure renewals or extensions on environmental surety bonds and other insurance policies to avoid angering the government regulators that oversee them. And they must generally work out uh, in any dip or cash collateral order the procedure by which a lender, a dip lender or a cash collateral party may call a default on the dip or cash collateral order and either seize their collateral or stop funding uh, any of the budget that they've agreed to, including professional fees, as this is a pretty catastrophic event, albeit rare to date. Um, Judges Jones and Isger in Houston, who typically handle these cases, uh, are generally sticklers for the default procedure and at least require that a notice of default be uh, filed on the docket and provided to creditors before the secured creditor exercises their remedies and basically shuts down the case. Before Kevin takes us back into a more fulsome discussion of Chapter 11, here's a quick list of ways to think about liquidity preservation both in and out of court. Out of court, producers may generally try to reduce operating expenses or G&A if there's anything left to cut after belt tightening that's been going on since 2015. As discussed, you can draw on an RBL if that is an option open to you. Or as we will discuss in further detail later, producers with significantly in-the-money commodity price hedges may consider monetizing their hedges for additional liquidity. Once in bankruptcy, debtors may use contract rejection to reduce future commitments. You can get fancy with your unsecured claims classification, uh, perhaps bifurcating go forward trade vendors that you want to give a, a much better, if not full, recovery, as opposed to other unsecured claims um, with counterparties that you don't see having much value for the business going forward. Just leave them in a, a general unsecured class. Um, you can do the same thing with trade versus unsecured bond debt as well, if you're so inclined. As Kevin touched upon in the RBL context, 
reinstatement from a cash perspective. Uh, it's just one way to avoid a use of cash to pay off a uh, more senior prepetition facility if you can't raise new funds. And there are other stakeholder rejection issues, some of which we'll touch upon again later. Um, how do you deal with affiliated entities and uh, your various operating and, and non-operating partners? All right, Sean, now let's go from conserving liquidity to exhausting liquidity and discuss uh, essential payments uh, that are due on the first day of the bankruptcy case. On the first day of the case, the debtors will typically request from the court sweeping authority to pay several categories of prepetition claims that would normally qualify as impaired, unsecured claims due at the end of the case and paid in small distributions. These amounts are generally authorized first on an interim basis uh, for payment of amounts due or coming due in the first 30 days of the case, and then on a final basis for the total amounts after formation of the UCC and a further hearing with proper notice. Uh, though Judge Jones did in Whiting allow the debtors to go straight to final relief uh, on payment authority at the first day hearing, which may encourage a more final relief approval-based strategy by debtors in Houston. Now, these amounts can be very substantial, as evidenced by the requests in Whiting, perhaps hundreds of millions in otherwise unsecured claims. The debtors typically argue that these claims must be paid to avoid state law mechanics liens on their assets, the accumulation of priority claims under the bankruptcy code against the estate, or to secure essential services or supplies from an irreplaceable or difficult-to-replace vendor. The prepetition secured lenders must consent to these expenditures and approve them as part of the dip or cash collateral budget. Categories of critical claims include employees and contractors, sometimes provided by a non-debtor operator or sponsor, as in the Sanchez case, which we'll get to in a second. In Whiting, these employee contractor claims that uh, they received authority to pay totaled more than $18 million. The debtors will also ask to pay prepetition claims of taxing authorities, including severance taxes to the states. In Whiting's case, that category included more than $25 million in expenditures. Uh, the debtors will also ask to pay certain critical vendors and suppliers. Uh, in these cases, generally oil field services companies. In Whiting, these totaled a whopping $293 million worth of happy oil field services counterparties. Uh, the debtors will also secure authority to pay amounts required to preserve surety bonds and other insurance, though these are typically smaller in amount. Now this slide talks some more about money going out of the estate and sometimes some pretty uh, awe-inspiring amounts. On the first day, the debtors will also generally ask the court for authority to make royalty payments to lessors and mineral interest owners usually arguing that this is required to prevent termination of leases or that royalties for past sales held by the debtors are not property of the estate under state law governing uh, constructive trusts and segregation of oil and gas revenues. The debtors will also ask to pay amounts due to non-operating working interest owners, uh, essentially non-operating joint venture partners. In Whiting, the debtors secured authority to pay more than $300 million in pre-petition potentially unsecured claims for royalties and other interest owners on the very first day of the case. The debtors also secured more than $27 million in authority to pay joint interest billing obligations, essentially reimbursement of advances for costs and expenses paid by other non-operating work working interest holders. Of course, not all debtors resolve these payments peaceably. Lessors may have disputes over the amount of royalties due or over payment for past royalties, as in the EP Energy case. The non-debtors may also seek relief from the bankruptcy stay to prosecute such claims in state court or a federal court rather than the bankruptcy forum, again, as happened in EP. The debtors also may have disputes over rights under operatorship or JV agreements with partners. A particularly ugly example is the Sanchez v. Gavilan lawsuit. In that case, Gavilan has sued for a declaration that it properly ter terminated pre-petition Sanchez's operating interests in, a drilling, in the drilling operations under their agreements due to Sanchez's failure to cooperate on completion planning and use appropriate completion technology. 
Uh, if successful, Gavilan's suit would result in a forfeiture of the debtor's 20% operatorship premium under the agreements, a substantial loss for the estate. Of course, in this action, Judge Isger actually called the warring parties, quote, idiots for not settling, and called the dispute, which focuses on the proper completion technology in the debtor's fields, the most ridiculous he's ever seen. Uh, that said, today that case went on for more trial, so uh, it is still going on. As an aside, if you want one good case study for everything that can go sideways in an oil and gas case, Sanchez may be it, though EP Energy gives it a run for the money. EMTs commonly use swaps and other derivatives to hedge out some of their oil and gas price risk. The idea being the hedges should at least perform well if the underlying business does not. For producers that are facing acute liquidity issues, they may face a decision whether to monetize in the money hedge books for immediate liquidity or to maintain their hedges in place. This has come up recently uh, in industry publications and discussions. Just want to note that from a, a bankruptcy legal perspective, reported value of an in the money hedge book may be reduced by various considerations, including the RBL facility terms, there may be limitations on a borrower's ability to terminate swaps. Um, for example, do you have a creditworthy counterparty, an acceptable counterparty to the lenders? Uh, the lenders may also, this was touched on briefly in the borrowing base redetermination discussion before, uh, lenders may have an ability to call a borrowing base redetermination upon the unwinding or the termination of a, a swap agreement. And then proceeds may also be um, collateral, potentially subject to prepayment provisions. So these are all just sort of practical um, constraints. Further transaction costs can eat up um, any you know, favorable in the money value pretty quickly. And there's a bankruptcy code safe harbor for swap termination. So normally where the automatic stay would prevent the counterparty from terminating an agreement purely because a, a debtor files for bankruptcy, you can still go ahead and, and do that with swaps. Um, and the, again, you know, when we're talking about value here, it's mark to market. And that can certainly change depending on who's doing the marking. And as a final practical consideration, the RBL facility and your swap counterparties may be one and the same. And there are you know, practical considerations there. If you are a debtor and you have to go back to your lenders for cash collateral, dip, exit facility purposes, the importance of lining up that financing and maintaining a decent working relationship with your lenders may uh, trump any desire to, you know, take some uh, more short-term oriented move relative to your, your swaps, uh, which uh, this is all just, I guess, to, to say be cautious about ascribing value to a producer's stated hedging program value at any point in time. And then finally, I mean, you can understand why these programs are utilized in the ordinary course. And so sometimes debtors, when they file for bankruptcy, they may seek to uh, continue you know, substantially similar hedging programs as they had pre-petition. We'll touch just briefly on NOL issues since those could provide enough discussion for their own webinar or even a semester-long law school class. In short, debtors may be able to preserve net operating loss carry forwards and other tax attributes through the bankruptcy as a substantial asset so long as they avoid a change of control in the case. In Whiting's case, for example, the debtors say they may have tax attributes in excess of $3 billion. To prevent a change of control, debtors typically secure an order requiring substantial holders, those holding 5% or more of the debtors' publicly traded securities, to notify them if they intend to buy or sell securities. We won't get too deep into the NOL issue here, but I would point you to PG&E's interesting post-confirmation use of NOLs, to fund a potential securitization transaction, which may be a sign of future NOL monetization strategies by reorganizing debtors. Turning to everyone's favorite oil and gas bankruptcy parlor game, 
can an ENP reject a midstream contract under Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code? Courts have now come out both ways. Yes, in Sabine, a 2016 Southern District of New York case that made it all the way up to the Second Circuit and interpreted Texas law. And no, more recently, uh, this past fall in the Alta Mesa case, as well as the uh, Badlands case, Alta Mesa, Southern District of Texas, Badlands, uh, District of Colorado Bankruptcy Court. The issue ultimately comes down to whether the agreement between the parties uh, runs with the land, which is a, a state law question, and there's a distinction between real property interests not subject to rejection and contractual rights, which are, again, under 300, 365, subject to rejection. Midstream companies, after Sabine, began seeking terms to create the real property interests. Uh, and one example would be whether, uh, you know, granting a, a mineral interest instead of just um, contractual requirements for delivery and, and payment. Ultimately, it may not matter whether a, a debtor can utilize this provision because these uh, these agreements may just be settled or renegotiated, like the, the basic principle of contract rejection. Debtor can reject off-market terms, and ideally the, the settlement pendulum swings back towards something that is more current market. That may happen uh, for uh, practical reasons, such as there are no other viable off-takers, and uh, affiliate issues may drive settlement as well in Alta Mesa, upstream E&P um, aspect of the, the larger company attempted to reject an agreement with a midstream affiliate, and they wound up just filing the, the Kingfisher midstream affiliate and pursuing a, a joint sale. Now let's hit on another source of contract-related grief in oil and gas bankruptcy cases, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, the difficulties with contracts with sponsors and other interest holders and JV partners. If a debtor is an operator rather than a, mere, than a mere interest holder, the sponsor may provide all of the necessary employees and administrative services to do the operating via a management services contract, an executory pre-petition contract. Generally, the sponsor will want this contract assumed or modified at its consent in the bankruptcy. For example, in the Southland case, sponsor Morningstar sought approval to pay retention bonuses to Morningstar employees working on the debtor's operations under the MSA. The sponsor may also have received large payments under the MSA before the bankruptcy, which could be subject to avoidance or preference actions by creditors of the UCC. In Southland, the UCC has embarked on a full investigation of every aspect of the relationship between Morningstar and the debtors. Creditors or the UCC may seek derivative standing from the court to sue sponsors on behalf of the debtors for avoidance of transfers, mismanagement, uh, or subordination or recharacterization of the sponsor's debt claims into equity interests. This was an ongoing fight in the Fury, Alaska case, which was resolved via stipulation among warring sponsors and investors, but may be reopened after the collapse of the debtor's second attempt at an asset sale, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. In addition to sponsors and operators, secured creditors may themselves be the target of bankruptcy court litigation in oil and gas cases. As an initial matter, a brief procedural note, and more than you probably want to know, lawsuits in bankruptcy court are typically brought as adversary proceedings, a freestanding action under but not in the bankruptcy case, which generally follows the procedural rules applicable to federal court litigation. Such suits are often brought against pre-petition secured creditors, in these cases RBLs and term lenders, for avoidance of their liens on particular kinds of estate property. In oil and gas cases, this often means a challenge to liens on mineral leases and related rights, which must be perfected by the lender's filing of financing statements and deeds in various recording offices in each different state under the sometimes ancient laws of each state. Creditors' committees may try to secure avoidance of liens on very technical filing grounds. For example, in EP Energy, the judge recently secured the debtors recently secured a judgment avoiding judgment creditors' lien on mineral assets 
due to two fatal flaws in the filing paperwork, including a mistake regarding the amount of attorney's fees covered by the lien. In the Sanchez case, creditors have challenged the lender's liens on the debtor's commercial tort claims and other collateral due to technicalities in the loan and filing documents. Often third parties, such as royalty owners, will also challenge liens on funds due to them, including funds that should have been segregated under special state laws regarding treatment of royalty payments, as I mentioned earlier when talking about collateral for dip and cash collateral financing. The UCC or the debtors may also sue prepetition lenders for typical lender liability actions, such as refusing to honor draws, making and receiving new making demands for and receiving new collateral shortly before the case or other quote bad acts. The UCC in the White Star Petroleum case in Oklahoma has asked for standing to sue RBL lenders for forcing the debtors into bankruptcy by constraining liquidity and negotiating for pre-bankruptcy payments and additional protection with a strained debtor. The effect of lien avoidance is to render the creditor's claim unsecured and thus parry pursue with unsecured creditors, including note holders, though note holders rarely pursue these actions. Although we are focusing more today on reorganization issues for oil and gas companies, it's worth noting that they may conduct 363 sales of some or all of their assets free and clear of liens, claims, and encumbrances, just like any other debtor. Of course, the environment is currently not very friendly for such sales, as evidenced by the Fury case, in which the debtors held an auction and selected a winning bidder that then refused to close. The debtors in that case then agreed to convey their assets to a new entity formed by lenders to undertake an acquisition by foreclosure, but after the March price collapse, that entity backed out. Now the debtors are negotiating again with other lenders and the original buyer that backed out of the first sale. If the debtors can actually find a buyer for their assets that will close, the liens of pre-petition and dip lenders will attach to the proceeds. Interest holders and mineral lessors will often intervene in the process at this point to make sure that their rights are preserved in the assets in the hands of the buyer. The buyer will also seek to reject burdensome agreements and assume below a market agreements, including midstream agreements and any of the other agreements we've talked to, as in any case. In some cases, the proceeds of the sale may be held in escrow rather than distributed to secured creditors pending resolution of lien challenges and litigation, as in the Alta Mesa case. Now this slide uh, moves us onward to the bankruptcy confirmation process and the over, an overview of confirmation issues facing one of these energy companies in bankruptcy. Uh, generally, going back to Bankruptcy 101, the debtor must file a disclosure statement with financial projections, evaluation, and a liquidation analysis showing what creditors would receive under a Chapter 7 liquidation and that the creditors would receive more under the plan, a key confirmation requirement. And it's important to keep in mind the importance of those financial projections, valuation, and liquidation analysis because those will be the key facts underpinning the confirmation process. The plan itself sets forth treatment of classes, restructuring transactions, and the mechanics of the post-confirmation debtor. In a pre-negotiated case, the plan and disclosure statement might be filed the first day, and if the case is pre-packaged with solicitation of votes pre-petition, then the case could be confirmed within 24 hours of filing, as in the Sheridan Fund 1 case that was confirmed in Houston on March 24th. One of the biggest confirmation issues facing energy companies right now is feasibility in the face of low prices, which we'll discuss more thoroughly in a second. Unsecured creditors committees in cases where unsecured creditors won't be paid in full, such as the current state in Whiting where they're going to be paid in full but subject to, still subject to negotiation, uh, those committees will generally focus on the best interests issue, whether they will, unsecured creditors might receive more in a Chapter 7 litigation. In a case where unsecured creditors receive substantial first day payments or are promised full payment in a plan, uh, UCC concerns won't play much of a part. The U.S. Trustee's Office, a division of the Department of Justice, will generally focus on plan releases, discharge, and exculpation terms, uh, legal issues that creditors don't worry about too much. 
Government agencies involved in the case often step in at this point to ensure that environmental protection bonds are renewed or replaced and that their claims are not discharged under the plan. Shareholders, joint venture parties, and sponsors in non-form payment cases will tend to focus on valuation if they're out of the money. They may argue that reserves are higher than indicated in the projections supporting the debtor's valuation, often citing earlier more optimistic published reserve reports or statements to RBL lenders, as in the Fury case. They may also adopt the operatorship issues raised in the Sanchez case, arguing that different proposed completion technology or well management strategies might yield a higher valuation that justifies payments trickling down to their level. Now let's step back for a second and talk about feasibility as a confirmation requirement because this is uniquely important to energy companies right now. The instant commodity price decline places special emphasis on the feasibility element. In a recent Chapter 22 case, Vanguard Natural Resources, which was a refiling in 2019 from an earlier case confirmed in 2017, Judge Jones in Houston cautioned the debtors at the disclosure statement hearing that he wanted a plan based he did not want a plan based on a hope and a prayer or numbers on a sheet of paper. Uh, he wanted the debtors to be able to, quote, weather the storms we all know are going to occur. He urged the debtors that they be sufficiently capitalized to survive a pricing down cycle, or otherwise, as he put it, everything we do in here will get undone. Of course, Judge Jones made these statements while prices were low, but nothing like today. Still, his comments suggest an emphasis on realistic price projections, those financial protect projections in the disclosure statement, in the plan valuation context, taking into account potential price shocks and more subtle declines in determining whether the debtors may have to file again as in Vanguard. That's something that every judge wants to avoid. Feasibility was also at issue in another recent case, EP Energy, which came into a late February confirmation hearing with a plan supported by certain uh, junior note holders who were also going to put up uh, a, a backstop for a new money rights offering. However, EP Energy came into the confirmation hearing with outstanding objections from a group of royalty holders as well as an ad hoc group of one and an eighth lien and one and a quarter lien note holders. For our purposes, we'll focus on the note holder group's feasibility objections. They first criticized the debtors for not sensitizing financial projections in the disclosure statement, which were as of December 6th. By contrast, uh, oil prices dropped as, not as much as they have recently, but they dropped between December 6th and early February when the ad hoc group's experts um, calculated a, a range of sensitivities for future results. And then later, after the confirmation hearing had begun in late February, um, did further downwardly revised price forecasting. Uh, ultimately, Judge Marvin Isger didn't care as much about that, although it was, you know, it's, it is a decent idea to uh, sensitize what you're what you're looking at in the future. Um, but what Judge Isger found the closest call was whether the debtors would have the ability to refinance debts coming due in the future. It was the only close call for the court. There was testimony, rather interesting testimony, that the debtors had flexibility under the terms of the reinstated one and an eighth lien notes to prime existing billion dollars of principal under that uh, facility with approximately $371 million of, of new priming debt if future capital markets were not accommodating at the times the debtors needed. Interestingly, Judge Isger made a few comments that I think arguably are a conflation of looking at changes in liquidity over time with assessing performance at a point in time, to wit, the court said, okay, well, the debtors are exiting Chapter 11 with X million dollars of cash on the balance sheet, and even if I take 
the more conservative estimate of liquidity over the next five-year period from the ad hoc group's expert, I can see that, oh, you know, in looking at cumulative cash flow over time, in the worst year in the future, the negative cumulative cash flow is not sufficient to exhaust all the debtors' liquidity. So kind of, you know, thinking about liquidity over time. However, you could alternatively look at it and say, okay, in year three, when you're talking about um, burning rather than generating cash, when the debtors also need to refinance, how will capital markets look at that? Can you refinance uh, as easily when you are burning cash? Maybe not. Judge Isger also is an interesting pointer going forward. There was a, a discussion about whether the debtor's use of the December 6th um, NYMEX strip pricing plus, uh, you know, the, the idea that what looked like a, a very quick dip was just a blip in February in pricing, whether that was, you know, an appropriate way to look at the situation. Um, can you rely on the idea that, oh, there, there may be some, some bumps in the short term, but we can still rely on our old projections, or should you look at the most recent or the current strip pricing as uh, proposed by the ad hoc group? And ISGR ultimately sided with the, the position of the ad hoc group that you should look at the most recent strip price. Uh, here the parties agreed that although not a, a perfect uh, valuation driver, 9x strip was uh, the, the best at hand. And then, as noted earlier, that, that um, backstop agreement and deal fell apart. So it uh, be interesting to see what the second confirmation hearing in EP Energy looks like. Uh, finally, a preview of coming attractions, Pioneer Energy Services, another case that was filed with um, an RSA in place and a planned construct prior to the, the most recent oil price declines. Uh, the ad hoc group in that case is now raising issues with the, uh, the debtors' projections and whether those projections are appropriate going forward. So keep an eye on that. Looking back to lessons from the 2015 to 2016 spike in oil and gas filings and what may be the same or different this time around, a few closing thoughts. Whereas some market participants bought into the last wave of bankruptcies based on prevailing valuation metrics at the time, I think it's fair to say there's been a decided pivot over the last several years to valuing EMPs on profitability rather than um, production growth, which could lead to higher valuation. So it'll be interesting as a, a derivative point of that, will asset quality matter more or be assessed on the more granular level um, this time around. With EMPs, you know, there's a question who's going to bid for what may be more marginal acreage that uh, under more conservative valuation assumptions just, you know, isn't, uh, isn't economic to, uh, to drill or to even maintain. In the context of oil field services, will overcapacity lead to more outright liquidations? Uh, Again, thinking about, you know, where's the, where's the bid for a given asset? Uh, a much less concrete consideration, but an interesting one nonetheless, is whether the growth of demand for ESG investment products may impact capital availability going forward. Over the last six months, there have been announcements by uh, various financial institutions about, um, you know, making, taking more climate change friendly stances, looking at uh, coal has gotten a lot of attention and well, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of distinctions you can draw between coal and oil and gas uh, the applications for oil that aren't just as a source of energy, um, you know, could be interesting to see several years from now whether that ESG trend, which again, may not be based on investment fundamentals, yet drives um, capital flows away from oil and gas investment. And then as a final point, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether there's more corporate structural change. We've talked today at various points about affiliate or 
closely held uh, management companies or uh, you know deals maybe not on um, terms that would hold up today or or be as interesting to a, a potential new asset owner. Um, so will that change? And then also, I mean, people have been talking about consolidation for years. Will we see more uh, potentially? But at this point in time, again, no one. All else equal, no one wants to do a stock deal when their their stock is at depressed levels. But we did see recently a, a cash deal where Jones Energy was purchased. Uh, Jones had a pre-negotiated plan confirmed in May 2019 with a three to four hundred million dollar estimated total enterprise value, three hundred fifty million dollar midpoint, and the disclosure statement contained uh, a liquidation estimate of two hundred sixty-six million dollars. Jones was ultimately acquired in January uh, with a $200 million approximately all cash consideration. So uh, again, will will be an interesting thing to keep an eye on, but there, there may not be uh, much consolidation if there's not much cash and parties are not incentivized to use stock. And that concludes the slide portion of our presentation. Please make sure you have submitted your questions as we will now switch over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Note that a replay of today's presentation will be posted on the Reorg Media page within the next 24 hours. Great, now let's see what questions uh, we have that have come in. So um, looking through, it looks like the first one, uh, Kevin, if you want to give it a shot, on the pre-filing RBL draws. What rights do the lenders have to refuse to honor a request, and what can a company do if lenders refuse? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, well, it's an interesting question. We've already seen one instance uh, since the beginning of the current crisis where an agent denied a revolver drawdown request. That was CIBC refusing to honor a request from Bonavista a couple weeks ago in our neighbor to the north. Um, generally, under the loan docs, the agent must honor the request if it has not been informed of a default by the debtor or a material adverse change, and the request satisfies the technical requirements of the loan docs, e.g. it is submitted uh, in the right time window and, and includes the right uh, statements from management and representation. In the 2008-2009 crisis, agents on several occasions declined to honor draw requests and this isn't just on RBLs, this is on any, um, on any revolving facility or delayed draw term loan. Uh, one nasty example was the Fountain Blue Las Vegas case in Miami in which B of A as agent denied uh, funding of a second tranche delayed draw term loan of about $900 million due to a technical failure in the timing of the request and specific defaults. And the debtor filed for Chapter 11 and immediately sued the bank to compel funding of that $900 million so they could finish a casino project out in Vegas. Uh, the bank ended up winning in the end on essentially it's the technical terms of the agreement. Um, full disclosure, I represented B of A in that case. Uh, but it was very costly, and in the end, no one really won because the debtor couldn't finish the project without that second draw. The first tranche lenders were already $1 billion deep. And the second tranche lenders and the agent were sued by everyone, including the debtors and the first tranche lenders. So it's really a, it's, it's a nuclear bomb situation. In most cases, they're going to err on the side of funding. Um, but I anticipate we're going to see at least a few of these in the messiest circumstance. We shall see. Thank you. Uh, Sean, uh, next one is for you. Uh, do you think there will be more material adverse change litigation? Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. For my money, probably not. I guess going back to one of the early on slides talking about um, risk allocation and thinking about the, the subset of people who may have signed up deals prior to the, the latest price drops and are now kind of evaluating their options. I'd, the way I'm thinking about it, just try to find the simplest way out. And that may mean the most objective condition breach or event of default. Um, and of course, way out may just mean you know renegotiation leverage. The, the way I'd think about it is maybe first look for objective over qualitative considerations, 
Um, if there aren't any really good objective ones that you can point to easily, then look for qualitative conditions that may be in your control before you go to something that's a little bit more amorphous and open to litigation. Um, I guess as examples of each on the objective, uh, did the did a counterparty fail to obtain a clean audit? That's a, a good one. You can just point to yes, no, this happened. Qualitative under your control um, in you know the example of an RSA, we may see language that certain things need to be quote acceptable to supporting parties. In EP Energy, there was a suggestion prior to the uh, the backstop and plant support um, agreements being terminated suggestion that the form of confirmation order acceptable to supporting note holders might be tripped up um, by some specific language. So that's one that, even though qualitative, a little bit more under your control if you're one of those uh, parties with consent rights. And then a material adverse effect clause, despite the amount of ink that's been spilled, you know, may or may not even be worded in a way that's useful to uh, wiggle out of a commitment. And then, of course, it's just subject to, uh, to litigation. All right, thanks, uh, Sean. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, it looks like we're coming close to the end of the hour, so that's all the time that we do have for today. Um, if we haven't gotten to your question, we will get back to you uh, offline. Uh, and also, if you have a few minutes, please take the survey that will appear on your screen in a few moments. Your feedback is very important to us. Thank you so much for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.